minutes sir so you can hear me fine right yes sir and can we try sharing my slides um yes sir uh, like once can you try if you are able to do that yeah. Can you see? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I still do. So it is stop sharing, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, it is stop sharing. Okay. Fine. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's start. So, right. So today is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Balraman Ravindran. Uh, Professor Ravindran heads the uh, Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI at uh, IIT Madras, uh, which is a leading interdisciplinary AI research center in India. Um, he is a Mindry faculty fellow and a professor of computer science at IIT Madras, and uh, he has been also recognized as um, a senior member of Triple AI for his uh, long-standing contributions to AI. Uh, he has also uh, held various visiting positions at IIC Bangalore, uh, University of Technology, Sydney, and is currently a visiting researcher at Google. His uh, research interests are centered on learning from and through interactions and uh, span the areas of geometric deep learning and uh, reinforcement learning. He has also authored. Uh, he has also co-authored the chapter on reinforcement learning in the Handbook of Neural Computation uh, by the Oxford University Press. Um, he received his PhD from University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, where he worked with Dr. Andrew Barto, and uh, his master's degree from uh, IIT Bangalore. Uh, on a bit, uh, I guess, on personal note, uh, Professor Ravi was my internship supervisor uh, last summer, and uh, till and since then I've been working with him uh, on projects related to reinforcement learning. Uh, unfortunately, I could not meet him in person due to the COVID situation. But uh, uh, it has been a great learning experience for me uh, working with him remotely, and uh, he has been a, a constant source of inspiration and motivation for me, uh, especially in my difficult times. Uh, so I'm really excited to give Professor Ravi the floor, uh, who will be presenting uh, various approaches for building the game, building gameplay uh, AI, and the role of reinforcement learning in it. Um, We'll probably be taking the questions at the end of the talk. So, uh, so if you have questions, then you can raise your hand and then ask in the end. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, so, can people see my slides? Yes, sir. It's visible. Yeah. Okay. You can see my slides. Great. Thank you, Vidya, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk here. And uh, so, I'm going to talk about. I mean, this is the title I gave. Right? Why do computers learn to play games? Uh, but reality, I mean, this is what I'm going to talk about. Right? Why do AI play games? Right? So it's not necessarily that. And uh, so this was meant to be a talk for a general audience, right? So, and uh, I know if some of you want to get deeper, uh, we can certainly uh, do that in the, in the question and answer session at the end, right? And uh, I like Vidya requested me to stick around for a while, so I would be available for. Uh, an extended question answer session at the end of the talk. Right? So let's let's get going. Right? So AI is everywhere, as all of you know. I don't have to uh, uh, really sell it, right? Whether it is uh, social media or whether it is more serious applications, the AI is everywhere, and it's also you know, getting out of the traditional IT sector and you know getting into judicial decisions and also financial decision making and so on and so forth, where AI is becoming a big thing, right? Uh, but uh, even before that, right? Yeah, and games are always in there, right? So we all get excited about all this big, big, big ticket news items that come out. So some, a few years back, uh, so you had this a uh, lot of excitement about AlphaGo, right? So it's the first computer program to defeat a professional human Go player, and that's Lee Sedol, uh, uh, the first to defeat a Go world champion. So that was uh, Lee Sedol, and it's arguably the strongest Go player in history. Uh, it's become so strong, in fact, that Lee Sidol uh, has now retired officially from playing Go, saying that it always bothers him that there is a stronger player than him out in the world somewhere. 
right? Uh, it's it's really like amazing. And then, and then of course, even before that, we had this uh, IBM's Watson, right? Uh, which uh, which which you played in this general uh, quiz show, right? And uh, managed to beat all the, the the champion of champions. Ken Jennings was a repeat champion of champions, and uh, beat him not just uh, badly but convincingly. And then there was Alpha Zero, and now more recently Mu Zero, right? There's a general AI algorithm that can just um, you know play multiple games like chess or shogi or go and you don't have to fine tune it for each game you just uh, let it go at it right and uh, yeah i can i can keep going right then you have uh, starcraft which is now a better player than 99.8 percent of all human players um but then uh, all these excitement about ai right so i'm going to give you a little historic perspective some of you might have seen uh, a few slides that I'm going to talk about now because I've been presenting this in multiple places, uh, but it always fascinates me that that uh, we we have been so taken up with this uh, one branch of science and keep it coming back to it repeatedly. Right? So AI is not new. So the first use of the term AI goes back to the Dartmouth uh, uh, Summer Research Project back in the summer of '56, right? And uh, so the goal that AI was start, started out to, right? So I, I like highlight it, right? Uh, to proceed on the basis that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that can that a machine can be made to simulate it. Right? So all this hoopla about uh, machines becoming super intelligent and all that is not—they're not really intelligent. They're just simulating uh, 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 intelligence reduced to a computational form. Right? Right. So literally from the very beginning, we have been talking about replicating human behavior as the hallmark of intelligence. Right? And uh, just not now, even back in like uh, 1952, uh, right? Arthur Samuel wrote the checkers player program for, uh, and then that was like really uh, very popular then. And then uh, he even demonstrated live on TV. He played checkers with a computer. Uh, this was in 1956. And uh, so his first learning program, which is completed in 1955, uh, was uh, surprisingly a reinforcement learning program, right? So even though he 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 didn't know to call it reinforcement learning, uh, but later on people just go back and looked at the way he actually set up the learning. Uh, it turns out it's a, uh, it's a, a reinforcement learning algorithm that he was using to learn to play checkers, right? And uh, just not that. And then there was this tic-tac-toe uh, game uh, played by. Uh, a set of matchboxes, which is, but I mean, the matchboxes was just a computational engine. Right? Uh, it was not, it's not computers, but it's still uh, a computational approach to playing tic tac toe. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, menace uh, uh, later in the talk. And then, of course, we have chess and AI. That's it's, it's a saga, right? Uh, so we have had multiple attempts at uh, uh, playing uh, state of the art. Uh, like uh, basically human level uh, AI uh, back in 1989. So for me, this is a very uh, 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 personally uh, important thing because um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, you know Deep Blue uh, beat uh, 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 Kasparov, right? Uh, when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, and then later on uh, they played a game with Anand, and Anand beat beat the beat the computer. So back in the 90s, uh, most of you wouldn't know, but uh, Anand used to be the second strongest player of chess, and he always used to come to uh, you know the the last le level and then lose to Kasparov, right? So and for us, uh, it was really nice to know that hey, come on, yes, Anand beat the computer that beat Kasparov. So, and then that was uh, one of the earliest instances when I got interested uh, in AI, right? And uh, so uh, going back, uh, so um, uh, so this was. Uh, uh, all the rage back in the 90s, right? When Deep Blue uh, defeated uh, Gary Kasparov. So, what is really important about Deep Blue beating Kasparov in 97 is that it was the first time uh, AI had beaten a, a, a grandmaster in chess uh, in regular time, uh, regular gameplay. Right? Before that, all it had all been uh, uh, rapid chess and other kinds of specialized uh, uh, settings, right? And uh, so, Kasparov made all these kinds of statements. I could feel human level intelligence across the room. And then in a few years, even a single victory in the long series of games would be a triumph of human genius, et cetera, et cetera, which is currently the state of the art it, as well as computer chess goes, right? So you don't, I mean, very rarely do uh, humans get to be the strongest chess playing program, even before the Alpha Zero and other things came out. So, right? So why, why is it that that is so much fascination 
in AI and playing games, right? So the way I, I look at uh, AI, right? So there is this multiple components of intelligence that we should be thinking of, right? Intelligence is not a monolithic thing, right? So there is this perception, right? So the ability to perceive, see, hear the world and things like that, where uh, 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 the modern generation deep mind networks are doing really well, right? They're, they're, they're achieving superhuman performance, right? And then there is this thing called cognition, uh, which is to doing with understanding what you have perceived, right? So, uh, you know, relating it to some kind of internal knowledge and, you know, making sense out of uh, what is it that you have perceived. And uh, yeah, and again, uh, uh, the the cognitive part, uh, we are making uh, inroads, but we are still not there yet, right? So we have not completely addressed the problem. Uh, but then you have these other two components of intelligence, which I call reasoning and decision making. Right, so it's where you use logic, and right, and you plan a solution, and then you can also recommend solution. You can make decisions for others. You can make your own decision, so on and so forth. And then finally, learning and adaptation, where you're not told what to do, right? You're not given the logic a priori, but uh, you're essentially looking at uh, you know examples, looking at how others are solving the problem, and then learning from that and adapting your behavior uh, to solve newer and newer problems, right? So, but in, if you think about it in a popular imagination, right? These two right, are really what 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 is intelligent, right? If somebody says, "Oh, yeah, that is an apple," you're not going to say that guy is intelligent. But but then if you if you say that Google developed the AI to you know, detect cats in videos, and you say, "Oh, yeah, okay, that is a good AI, very strong AI," but if somebody says, "Oh, I know, I can see a cat in a video," you're not going to call that human intelligent, right? But then you say that, "Oh, this guy is very good at playing chess," or he he's he can learn anything very quickly, and so so the popular perception of what is uh, what what is intelligence, right? Actually, is limited to the last two part, right? And it turns out that these two are actually easy to demonstrate in games, right? If you look at the earlier earlier times when people were looking at uh, AI, right, they were not too too involved, right? If you go back uh, to the uh, uh, early days, right? So they they understood that perception is a hard problem for computers to solve. Cognition is a hard problem to, for computers to solve. And it turned out that reasoning and learning and adaptation were more easy to systematize, and they were easy. They were more uh, you know easy for people to attack, right? And they felt that this was easy to demonstrate the fact that you can reason, the fact that you can learn, easy to demonstrate in games. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, people gravitated towards games as a very natural proving ground for AI. And the whole hope was that, OK, once I have done this with games, I should be able to take the same principles that I develop here and use it for solving other places. Right? So what are the advantages of game play? Right? So game play has well-defined objectives. Right? You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, suppose I'm solving a real life uh, planning problem and trying to make some decisions for a city as to how they should invest their money and so on and so forth. There's so many trade offs that I have to come up with, and it's not even clear what is a good answer, right? What, what should be the good answer? But in games, no, you win, right? So, well defined objectives. And like I said, the cognitive part mostly is taken care of, even though nowadays, with the advent of deep learning, people are actually getting into more. Uh, uh, perceptually and cognitively challenging games uh, because because you can, right? So the the so that part is uh, at least originally when people are playing chess, uh, you know, it's easy to take care of. And then third part is it's easy to simulate. Right? You can I can I can I don't need the uh, very expensive uh, equipment. I can easily very very easily simulate these games. Therefore, uh, 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 that made it repeatable. Also, right? Once I can simulate it. Uh, then I can make it repeatable, and then it's suitable for learning. And finally, it's uh, games can be made uh, complex, right? Uh, it can be made sufficiently complex so that they require non-trivial reasoning and decision making. And the fact that you can demonstrate non-trivial reasoning and decision making and this learning ability of agents on games, you know, really makes it a suitable uh, an approving ground for uh, AI. Yeah. So this is kind of why you you know uh, uh, people build uh, game playing AI and it kind of stuck uh, in the popular imagination also. Whenever uh, we beat a human champion or something like that, people turn around and look at it uh, because because of these research, right? Because they think, okay, this must require intelligence as opposed to cats on YouTube. Okay, uh, so let's let's move on now. So I, I hope I convinced you why why it's uh, why it's useful to look at games for AI, right? And why AI play games. 
Uh, let's talk about a few approaches for cape laying. I have I, I, up front. I will give you a disclaimer. Right, this is a very, very, very uh, uh, esoteric collection. I mean, just I picked picked a few uh, broad, broad approaches, uh, admittedly. But uh, this is by no means an exhaustive uh, tutorial on how to build a game playing AI. Right, so uh, so just going to give you the highlight. So the earliest approach to looking at this is to look at some kind of rule based. Right. So, uh, so for example, if your opponent has two pieces in a row, right? So two pieces in a row, then mark the third piece. Because I'm assuming all of you know what tic tac toe is, right? So this is an example of tic tac toe. Right? Uh, uh, then uh, there's another rule: if X is marked in one corner and O is not in the center, then mark one of the other corners like this, right? So it turns out that this is actually a very strong move, uh, rather than trying to occupy the center, but. Uh, uh, I don't know. So, so some kind of rule here, right? So we just make up these rules, and then uh, the AI just uh, you know looks at the board, figures out which rules apply, and then decide which among those rules is the right one to pick now. Right? Usually, these things are all pre-wired, right? I mean, but but uh, it's it's still a, a, a decision-making problem, right? And then you do this, right? So, in fact, you think, hey, games, what's a big deal? But then. It carried over, right? So we could build uh, primarily, uh, uh, I mean, rule-driven systems, but uh, can make uh, all kinds of amazing stuff, right? So, one of, for example, one of the earliest uh, conversation agent called Eliza, right? Uh, it's uh, what was called an expert system back then, uh, uh, was a rule, rule engine, right? It turns out that once you start building more and more complex rules, uh, it's actually non-trivial to determine which are the rules that apply now and uh, which one should I pick among them? You know, if there are conflicting rules, which one should I pick and how do I maintain rule bases? And so there are, there are a lot of work that needed to be done, uh, but it's just not rule bases. Uh, we're not just used for playing games, but they also were used for building these kinds of more complex uh, conversations. In fact, a lot of the uh, even modern day uh, uh, dialogue systems or conversational uh, systems right, that are deployed uh, uh, are largely rule driven. Right? So, uh, so, but then what is the problem with these rule-based approaches? As I already told you, rules can get complicated. Right? Think about writing a huge rule base for chess. I mean, people could, people have tried, right? And uh, so it becomes harder and harder for you to process these rules, like I uh, said earlier, and also hard to maintain the rules if I want to keep adding new rules to the system. Now, the second thing is uh, uh, experts, right, find it very difficult to articulate rules. They know exactly why they did something. Uh, they know that they have to do something at a given instance, but to actually write down everything, right? And then you, you, they'll, they'll probably specify something for you. You write it down, and then you implement a rule, and the rule doesn't work. And then you go back and ask the expert, hey, the rule didn't work. He'll then, oh, yeah, OK, this particular instance, that was not true. Therefore, the rule didn't work. So, and then you have to keep going back and forth. So this is these are the problems that people felt that. So they had to come up with other approaches. So the second popular kind of approach, and that's has a very hoary tradition in AI, right? Uh, is uh, what what are called search-based methods. So what you do with search-based methods, you you start off with your current uh, position, right? And then you systematically enumerate all the moves and outcomes, right? So you look at this. Okay, these are all the three possible places I could put an X in. And then I can, once for each of these, what are the possible responses that Wo can make? And each of these, what are the possible responses Wo can make? And then you go all the way up to reach these leaf nodes, right? And at this point of time, you know that, okay, if you're going this way, okay, Wo will, will probably not win, right? But if you go this way, there's a good chance that Wo will win, right? But there's also a chance that the X could win, right? So you, you basically take, look at all the three, Options and then you decide that okay, this seems to be the only way uh, for me to go uh, where Bo doesn't win at all, and there is still a chance that X could win if Bo doesn't make. So you basically do all these kinds of exploration, right? Uh, so if this exploration, the, the space is really small, right? We could look at all possible outcomes just like I did now, and then we could try to get to an optimal solution. Uh, but uh, if the space is very large, like chess, right? Uh, so what do we do? Uh, Oh, okay, I had some more slides uh, elsewhere. I'm missing those. Sorry about that. Um, uh, suppose it's a more complex game like chess. What do I do? I really can't go ahead with this, right? Because if I continue with this, uh, I mean the the search space will explode really, really large, very soon. So what do I have to do? Is I have to have very clever ways of pruning down the uh, uh, the search tree, if you will. 
right? So that I don't I don't expand all possible uh, pathways. I only look at a, a few of them, right? And so Deep Blue essentially played uh, using search, right? It essentially was uh, the search was at the core of Deep Blue, not the plain vanilla search I described on the previous slide, uh, but more uh, uh, involved search algorithms. And surprisingly, Watson also uh, operated on search. Uh, primarily, the core of it was search, but it used a lot of uh, knowledge representation, more on the cognitive side of things, right? And uh, but that's primarily was 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 operating on search, right? And um, and not just in game playing and quizzing and things like that, but uh, some of you have been working with bots, you would know that uh, many path planning algorithms. Uh, 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 operate uh, uh, in this fashion as well, right? Path planning works, or path planning works. Uh, uh, also operate this way, right? Uh, so the, the main problem with uh, uh, search-based methods is the exploration space will be very complex, and you need, really need clever ways of searching through these outcomes, and you don't always, always uh, 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 come up with uh, the right way of pruning. And even if you come up with the right way of pruning, uh, the computational requirements could be fairly large. When they want to do this kind of search based right? So, what people did uh, was then they moved on uh, to uh, learning approaches where you didn't have to do that much of search. It's kind of like rule based because given a move, given a board, I'll immediately tell you what the next move to make. You don't have to actually go out into the uh, uh, search tree, game tree, and then come back with the move, right? So, and it takes advantage of the prior games that the humans have played. And so you, you essentially uh, uh, end up seeing your uh, data like this, right? So this is the original state, and this is the move the human made. Okay, here is here is a state, and I'm uh, oh, sorry, this should have had a zero here. And this is a state, and this is the move that the human made, right? And here is a state, and here is a move the human made, and so on and so forth. They're given these kinds of paths, right? If this is the current state, this is the move you have to make. Right? Given these kind of paths, and you learn how to. Uh, uh, learn a rule that tells you, given a state, what is the move to make, right? And there's numerous success stories of using this kind of supervised learning approaches, uh, whether it is playing backgammon, whether it is playing Othello, right? Uh, or whether it is playing checkers or chess. I mean, there are a variety of uh, uh, domains in which these have had uh, enormous success. And of course, as you know, supervised learning is also behind most of the success stories that you see on this slide. This is essentially my very first slide that said AI is everywhere, right? Uh, and almost all the success stories that I have here uh, are trained through supervised learning, some form of supervised learning or other, right? So whether it is extracting a text box here, identifying faces, mammograms, or dark spots on x rays, or recognizing voice commands, or, or uh, you know, looking at the best way to route things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many of these are trained through supervised learning, right? So a lot of success stories. But the main problem, going back to the game scenario with supervised learning, is that it's heavily biased to the playing style provided in the data set, right? And as you can, as you must be reading in the news more recently, all the language generation things trained by, you know, the internet text are heavily biased towards all the all the all the prejudices and uh, you know, uh, uh, and hatred that's floating out there on the internet, and uh, they do they do tend to be uh, more biased and. Uh, ethically unsound, right? So that's one of the problems with supervised learning. And uh, in the game domain, it's also limited by the human understanding of the game. So can potentially end up learning something suboptimal. Um, what am I doing on time? Okay, not too bad. Um, so so what, what can we do about this, right? So we needed to come, to, come, up, come up with an approach where you don't necessarily uh, rely on, on, on a human. To provide you the right approach, right? You learn by doing, right? I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, anybody who has heard me ever talk about reinforcement learning has seen this cycling slide, uh, uh, and it's a very popular way of motivating RF, right? So all these models of learning that you see, saw supervised learning, essentially rely on this kind of a database, right? whether it is for playing games or on any of those tasks that I showed you, where uh, you have uh, the input and the desired output. Right? But then think of how you learn to cycle. So learning to cycle, you don't have the input-output pair like that, right? I mean, I can give you 1,000 hours of videos 
of people cycling on YouTube. That doesn't mean you can get on the cycle and start cycling after that. So you have to get on the cycle. Or try cycling a few times, fall down, get hurt. So there is some kind of feedback. It is not without feedback. But the feedback is not what you should do. The feedback is something like, OK, what you did was not right. So I say the difference for you to think about RL versus uh, supervised learning is uh, in supervised learning, you get instructions. You are told what to do. Okay, If this is the input, this should be the output. In reinforcement learning, the feedback you get is evaluation. Okay? You do something. You first give me an output. I'll tell you whether the output was good or bad. So it's evaluation. So. So that also leads to the other thing with uh, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, reinforcement learning, is that you have to try different things. You can't just try one thing and then and then be done with it. You have to try different things so that uh, you know which is the right one to try. Right? So that's the uh, uh, the crux of reinforcement learning. Because you're learning from evaluation, you basically have to uh, make sure that uh, you try try enough things. Right. And it's not just cycling, right? So it's not just the cycling part. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, we a lot of learning that babies do, right? Uh, or, or reinforcement learning, right? Whether it is learning to walk. Right? I mean, you don't really demonstrate to the baby how to walk, right? The baby gets up and then runs around, falls down, right? And uh, then they learn, finally, and they get civilized, right? Same thing with talking. Right? So reinforcement learning is actually a very fundamental uh, learning paradigm. So how do you play games uh, with reinforcement learning? So remember tic-tac-toe. Uh, so what I'm going to say is, uh, instead of telling you what is the right move uh, to make in a, in a given position, like what we saw in uh, the supervised learning setting, uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to give you uh, evaluation. So what, what would be evaluation? So if you win, if you get three Xs in a row, for example, you get a plus one. If you lose, right? So if you get three three rows in a row, the opponent gets three rows in a row, they get a minus one, they say, hey, that's bad. And then if you draw, like nobody wins, then you get a zero, right? So that's the kind of evaluation you're going to get. And you have to learn from repeatedly playing this game again and again, right? So how would that look like, right? So here is one example. Let's go back to the menace setting, right? This was back in the 60s, right? And uh, uh, Michi was like one of the, uh, the leading lights of AI in the UK, right? And uh, Chambers, uh, they, they, they set up this uh, uh, collection of matchboxes to play tic-tac-toe. Right, so as you can see, each matchbox right, corresponded to a particular board position. Right, so here, uh, here there are all two O's and two X's. So always the next move is uh, going to be made by X. Right, and in each matchbox, uh, you had different colored uh, beads. Right, and each are marbles. Right, the different each color corresponds to one move that you could make. If there are five positions here, there would be five different colors in this box. Right. So what you do is, uh, at the beginning of the game, all the boxes are closed, and all of them have been initialized with uh, 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 with a certain number of uh, marbles of each color. right? And then, as the game proceeds, when you come to a particular position, right? you open the box corresponding to that position, right? take out a marble of a particular color, and blindly play your move in the position indicated by the color. Now what you do is keep track of all the marbles that you have taken out in all the matchboxes. Right? At the end of the game, if you win the game, right, you put back two marbles of the color you took out from each of the boxes you opened. You would have at most opened five boxes. right? So each of the boxes you opened, you put back a, uh, two marbles of the same color. Right? If you lose the game, you throw away the marble and close the boxes and get ready for the next game. Right? Throw away all the marbles and get ready for the next game. If you draw the game, put the marbles back into the box, right? Don't 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 change the number. Just put the marbles back into the box, close all the boxes, and be ready for the next game. If you repeatedly play this, what is going to happen is, as time proceeds, the probability of you picking up a marble of the color that led you to a win is going to keep going up, right? So the more marbles of say brown was the color that you picked to win. Then you put back two two browns, right? Eventually, what will happen is you'll have a lot of browns in the box, and so you'll be playing that uh, the moves that lead you to win more often. So that was essentially the idea. Right? It's a, I mean, they did this all this with match boxes and marbles, but if, if you write it as a, a program, it is like five lines of code probably, right? So 
whenever you win, you increase the pro increase the probability of picking those moves. Whenever you lose, you decrease the probability. And this is actually a very valid reinforcement learning algorithm. Then you could you could learn to play this way. So let's look at what happened. Right? Let's say that there was this game that happened, right? And then I have written down the game three, the, like like the search tree that you saw, right? And then let's say you play the game and and then you you win, right? And now what I'm saying in the in the matchbox example is, you go back along this path, right? Look at all the times when you made a move. Okay, so you made a X here, then you made an X here, then you made an X here. So all of these X's, you increase the probability of making it the next time. Okay, is it clear? So that's basically what we did. So went all the way to the end, figured out that we won. Okay, and then went back and changed the probabilities of all the moves that we made for the win. Okay. So let me ask you this question though. Uh, um, suppose I'm here. Right. Do I need to finish playing the game to know that I have won? Not really, right? Because there are two uh, two ways in which I can make three X's from here, either putting a X on the top row or putting a X in the last column. Right. In both cases, uh, I can win. Right. So O can block only one of the two. Therefore, at this point, I know that X has won. I don't really have to play till the end of the game. Uh, to figure out that x is one, so what I can do is I can go back and say, "Hey, putting an x here is a great move." So increase the probability of that because it's taken me into a position where I will surely win from here. Right? This is great, and I can do this kind of short circuiting the learning process if I know, uh, if because I know the rules of the game, right? I just I just I kind of reasoned it out and knew that I'll win from here. But what about more complex situations other than tic tac toe? Right? So in such cases, what I do is I just keep track of every for every board position that I have seen so far. Right? What fraction of the games from there have I gone on to win? Right? So maybe from here I have gone on to win, say, 90% of the games. Right? Maybe from here I haven't won that many. Maybe I have won only, uh, say, 60% of the games. But then I have taken a move that has taken me from a 60% winning chance. To a 90% winning chance, therefore the move has to be good. So I'll increase the probability of playing the move. Likewise, if I go from a 60% winning chance to a 40% winning chance, say the move is bad, so I'll decrease the probability of playing the move. Right? So I can I do this repeatedly. Right? I don't have to wait till the end of the game because I'm using, making advantage of the fact that I'm doing this repeatedly. So this essentially is what's called temporal difference learning. And I was proposed by uh, Barto Sutton and Anderson. So Andy Barto was my uh, PhD advisor, and uh, this is uh, this has had tremendous impact, not just in AI but also in behavioral psychology and neuroscience. And uh, and uh, so it's, it's it's a very 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 simple idea, but uh, very very profound uh, in terms of uh, the implication uh, of this. Right. So so and, and all the all the all this excitement of RL and things like that are all built on this very simple intuition. Right? So all of this is fine. So we can build reinforcement learning systems to play tic tac toe for sure, right? We can count and everything because you have to do a whole bunch of things, right? So you have to keep track of what is the next move to play. You have to keep track of how traction they have won and so on and so forth. So how do I do this for larger games, right? Sorry. Uh, let's say I want to play Go, right? So we know now AlphaGo was 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 built using an RL agent plus search, and then we have Backgammon. There is a game called TDGammon again, which was built using RL. And and uh, so how did you do it for such games where the uh, 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 this, the kind of board positions are very very large, right? And or or even something as as more more complicated like uh, Starcraft or like uh, whatever Age of Empires, right? So here you get into re deep reinforcement learning. I'm skipping a couple of decades of evolution of this, uh, but the idea here is that I'm going to have something that learns the features. That are important for me in a game, right? And then I'm going to just learn the control, uh, basically what move to make, uh, sitting on top of the set of features that I have learned. Right? So it kind of split it into two problems, even though I don't solve them independently, I solve them jointly, right? Uh, so that's essentially what 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 needs to be done, right? And uh, so. Uh, it's great. So far, I have told you why uh, why why we want to do reinforcement learning, right? So we can go beyond the human knowledge, right? So we can go beyond human knowledge in the sense that I don't have to wait for somebody's supervision, like like in Neurogammon, but I can learn through self-play, right? So the very first uh, big success story of self-play was by Jerry Tesaro, 
uh, where uh, he designed the human level uh, backgammon player back in the 90s. In, in the late 80s, Jerry had this Nero gammon. It was there on one of my earlier slides, uh, which you supervised learning to learn how to play this game of backgammon. And uh, so what Jerry did uh, uh, in the 90s when he heard about reinforcement learning, right, uh, without really understanding all of it, because back then the theory said that uh, reinforcement learning should not really work with, uh, you know, a neural network. He got it to work with a neural network, right? And what is even more important is that he had two copies of the players, right? Two copies of the learning agents playing against each other. And uh, it learned, right? It, it, it uh, did uh, I mean, several weeks of uh, self-play, uh, which is equivalent to several years of human playtime. Uh, but still, uh, it learned. And not only did it learn to beat humans, uh, it actually learned new moves, right? Not recorded by humans in uh, centuries of playing. So people actually wrote articles analyzing the kind of moves that uh, uh, the, uh, the the TD Gammon agent was making, right? And history kind of repeated itself. And if you remember, we talked about the AlphaGo, right? And AlphaGo uh, so at one point was also doing a little bit of training, uh, 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 right, by playing against itself, right? So. So there were many moves which people were very surprised by. One of the earliest one was uh, something called Move 37. And uh, so look at some of these things. That's one commentator said that's a very strange move. And he, he just didn't understand what was happening when the game was happening. Right? And then I thought it was a mistake. Right? And it took Lee Sinol maybe 15 minutes. I mean, remember, imagine a time control game taking 15 minutes to formulate a response. Right? Basically, she was so confused, he'd never seen it before. Right? And uh, it turned out to be something that was actually very, very uh, useful move and needing to win. And the people hadn't analyzed that before, while AlphaGo had discovered that through self play. Right? So these are all. Uh, I mean, so again, uh, the defense of the ancient uh, engine again was tried using self play, and it was learning uh, um, right uh, strategies that uh, people wouldn't have been able to feed it. Right. Same thing with Alpha Zero. Uh, same thing with Mu Zero as well. Right, and that's one part of it. Right, so RL allows you to go beyond uh, uh, human knowledge because you can do this thing kind of, uh, you know, learning by self-play or uh, training against other copy. Another thing uh, which actually makes uh, reinforcement learning more uh, more applicable, right, is that you can actually take heuristics, right, and you can improve on the heuristics, right, by using reinforcement learning. You can you can get the the whole trial and error learning part of RL. Right, to start off on a, on a prior policy, right, or a prior way of playing, some kind of heuristic or rule base or whatever it is that you have, and right, you can get the RL agent to sit on top of it, right, and somehow improve from that, right. There are many examples of this. For example, Starcraft, right. So it uh, it kind of was seeded by looking at uh, you know imitation uh, policy, right. So you look at uh, how humans are played, and then you start off with that, and then you keep improving on that using RL. Uh, the same thing with uh, non-game environments here, right? So there was this uh, uh, Google uh, data center uh, management uh, thing, right? So how to how to do the power management in Google data center and using a variant of uh, AlphaGo-like engine, right? Uh, they actually took a heuristic that uh, humans were using and kind of rolled it out and did much better than that. And you can and they saved the uh, forty percent on the cooling curve, right? And then, uh, and then, of course, a lot of uh, recent excitement about uh, an alpha fold. And for a long time, people are saying that this is not going to happen. I mean, this slide, I, I should have replaced it with the later one, uh, was for last year, when an AE agent received, achieved 25% improvement over the best human effort on protein folding, right? Uh, so, oh, just stepping back. So protein folding is a very complex problem, right? So we, we, we know the protein sequence, as you can see here. I mean, it's easy to get the sequence information. But from the sequence information, getting to the 3D structure of the protein, right? it turns out to be a non-trivial problem. And people have been struggling with this for a long time. right? And then there is this annual competition people run where you try to predict uh, the structures of some proteins that people have already you know, uh, discovered. But then uh, the competition is without knowing the structure, can you predict the structure of those proteins? Right. And turns out last year, uh, uh, DeepMind uh, made an entry that kind of achieved 95%, uh, 25 percent improvement over the nearest uh, human effort. But usually, the top teams are clustered within five, five, six percent of each other. But this this one beat it by 25 percent. And this year, Alpha Fold version two uh, basically got a near perfect score on all the known protein structures so far. Uh, 
so the performance was so mind blowing uh, that the people have almost kind of uh, decided to call the protein folding problem a solved problem I, i'm still skeptical but there is a good uh, traction of the community has a sentiment that they should just call it solved and move on and try to look at other things uh, because the performance is so convincing right uh, so it's an, it's amazing but the point here is this was not completely done by learning from scratch right there was a human uh, uh, component that was already there so some there are some databases right that basically people had looked at scoring certain uh, substructures and so on and so forth all that information was taken in right and and then the, those were used as heuristics uh, uh, to guide the rl data right it's not completely rl so here's another uh, example from uh, uh, from the pre rl uh, 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 domain right and this is uh, from the ut austin's robo soccer team and uh, this is led i mean this is old one right it's not even recent I mean, they have been doing more amazing stuff but the reason i like this right is uh, they the robot agents were not trained completely using rl so they were actually there they had a variety of different uh, kinds of approaches which uh, peter stone calls layered learning right so they used different approaches for solving different problems and one of the things that they actually used rl for was how to kick the ball and so it basically it learned to kick the ball uh, to the goal because it's a hard problem you know standing and kicking you have to stand on one leg and generate enough force with the other leg to kick the ball and then they got this agent trained it, it trained so well that it could kick it into the goal from very very far away right so if you had used rl to solve the whole problem probably it would have taken a long time for it to learn but you can see that uh, uh, it's it's actually becoming very good at kicking the ball into the goal and uh, eventually uh, i can show you the final line right so it won 14-0 here and over the course of the tournament it had 88 goals for and one goal against because it became so good at uh, uh, kicking the ball into the goal from wherever it was and that part alone was trained using rl so what next uh, well deep rl has really i mean revived excitement in the community you can see that we are right so the number of papers is exponentially growing right uh, but then uh, many fundamental questions are still need to be addressed right so here again is a slightly dated uh, uh, video right so you can see this uh, uh, so you can uh, this agent is actually playing soccer and able to score goals and all that right and then the red agent is trying to stop it and both of them doing something but now what happens the red agent just lies down on the ground and starts crying and you can see that the blue guy is tap dancing around the ball right this gets completely confused because this is not a behavior that the agent has seen so it's completely confused it doesn't know how to predict to see right and that's not something that you would expect of any kind of a reasonable uh, learning system right so so that's quite a ways to go to make sure that uh, you know uh, we do something that's logically consistent not just something that is uh, you know statistically consistent based on the training that we have seen so far right so the goal for me is that we have to build an omnivorous learning agent right uh, can consume any information to learn including domain uh, knowledge right and also any kind of uh, Uh, logic that you have any reasoning systems any abstraction that the human has any any world model like any differential equations that we have that describe the world all of this information should be able to be you know conveyed to the ai agent and it should use it to learn right this is closer to how humans learn right? so if you really want to do strong ai that's the way you have to do it right so i have a slide uh, i can come back to this right i can come back to this slide in a bit i think uh, we are out of uh, time or do we have more time it will be we have some time we can continue okay great so uh, so uh, okay this is literally my last slide right so I, i mean i can show you my conclusion then even come back to this i wanted to spend more time on it right? so people ask me when to use rl when not to use rl and things like that so i i have a few thoughts here right? not complete, again not exhaustive sorry uh, so here is the first uh, situation so when the desired output right is unknown uh so what do i mean by that so uh so it could be a supervised learning problem it could be normal supervised learning problem right where the labels for you are hard to obtain right? so i don't know how so it could be like a, a, a like a situation where label, getting label information is very expensive it could be like a medical domain could be uh, could be like a, 
domain where you need real real expertise a lot of analysis have to go before i can assign a label to a uh, data point and so on so forth right in such cases you could use reinforcement learning and in fact one uh, nice way of using rl there is looking at what is called active learning or active labeling problem right and uh, the second uh, instance where you use rl uh, is uh, i mean i mean conversely uh, let me let me talk about the not part also right conversely uh, when sufficient human human label information is available right if you if you have a, a very nicely labeled data set right uh, then use supervised learning or semi supervised learning right? so you don't really have to do rl there, right? so even though a lot of people fancy using reinforcement learning for everything right uh, uh, supervised learning and semi supervised learning do have stronger signals for learning than rl so you should probably use that whenever it is appropriate right so the second class of problems where i would uh, like to do rl is uh, problems where the optimal policy is not known i mean it's not like it's it's uh, it's people haven't computed it. people just couldn't see a way of computing it so far because the system is so complicated right and uh, so they, they they don't know how to com uh, compute it and in such cases uh, you can look at reinforcement learning right but then again when you can actually set up a, you know on a classical control uh, you know for a classical controller and you can build a near optimal controller using classical control system use that don't 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 blindly go to rl right if there is something small bits that you can fix with rl then use rl like like talked about the kicking the, uh, the ball problem right and then third there are there are really hard control problems which you just can't solve and people have a very variety of approximation techniques for it and uh, reinforcement learning is certainly one of those that you should be using there and uh, there is another class of algorithms called model predictive control so like rl in fact uh, sometimes when i'm giving uh, talks to control theory audiences i have to actually have a slide that tells them what is the difference between model predictive control and rl and uh, when you have good models when you have a way of estimating a good model of the world right like I'm, I'm talking here about dynamic model and right? not, not talking about the world and things like that. Talking about good dynamics model, right? Then use model predictive control, but otherwise RL is a great case, right? This is one set of problems where the output output the controller is, is hard. Right? The second set of problems, right, is when the data itself is expensive or or, or insufficient. Uh, mainly because uh, you have to do some amount of uh, experimentation, right? You have to figure out what is the right setting uh, before I can even do the data gathering, right? Uh, for example, some kind of uh, resource allocation uh, situations, right? Uh, where uh, where people sometimes use A/B testing, right? Is this good or is this good, right? So, uh, so typically, I would say that A/B testing is something that you use uh, when the allocation. Right? How much? How many times do I try A versus how many times do I try B? It doesn't really depend on the outcome, right? I say, okay, ten times you show A, ten times you show B, and then we'll figure out which one is better, right? It doesn't depend on the outcome, right? But then, RL is great when the allocation depends on the outcome. Hey, if you first start off by showing one A and one B, then we'll take it from there, right? So let us see how often people click on A, how often people click on B. And then slowly maybe put more budget for a1 a2 as opposed to just testing a and b you know so so those kinds of you know on the fly uh, uh, you know uh, that the where the actual decisions that you make uh, are dependent or the data gathering decisions that you make are actually dependent on the the outcome of the previous experiments you have done right in such cases use reinforcement learning right if you are running deterministic experiments Quite often, RL might not be the answer, but there are uh, 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 exceptions to that. But uh, um, again, if, if the combinatorially many many outcomes, then uh, even with uh, deterministic experiments, you might want to use RL. Then the final class of problems I talk about is when there's a sequence of decisions to be made. Right? Uh, it's hard to label all possible sequences. Right? So I mean, of course, people do that in language, but in most other situations, it's hard to label all possible sequences, and uh, therefore, people uh, like to use uh, a, a sequential learner, sequential decision maker like RL, right? And uh, other cases where the sequential labeling problem is actually a non-IAD problem, where the your decisions you make down the line actually depend on the decisions you made up front, right? In such cases, using uh, something like reinforcement learning, which optimizes the policy as a whole. Uh, is, uh, is is important, right? So then you use RL, 
Uh, of course, when human demonstrations are available for the sequence, demonstrations in this case would be labels, right? If human labels are available for uh, trajectories, right? Uh, use them, right? Don't use, don't be, don't be reliant completely on other, uh, but use them with care because human demonstrations, like we already saw earlier, right, uh, can uh, can kind of push you into the suboptimal paths. Uh, while you might want to start with human demonstrations, but you might want to uh, uh, improve on it down the line. Right? So, so those are uh, some of my you know quick thoughts I put down in terms of when when to use RL and when not to use RL. And we can discuss more during the questions. Of course, uh, a lot of references out there, and uh, more 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 have come on online now. Uh, but just just to, too many of them out there. And of course, I I also have a short tutorial on. Uh, uh, that I gave uh, uh, COVID, yeah, a few, a few years back now. I don't know, maybe two years ago. Uh, COVID has reset my temporal uh, perception, so I, I don't know when things happen anymore. Um, yeah, so you can look at that, and also you can, my, of course, some of you might know that my RL courses are online, uh, my RL lectures are online. You can look at that as well, and feel free to browse through our website or the center of my website for some of the more interesting work in this slide. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Any questions? I'm happy to take. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Sir. It was a great talk. Um, and uh, yeah. So if people have any questions, so they can um, raise their hand. Uh, I have a like. I have some questions ready. Like the people. Uh, people have. Uh, pre people had prepared some questions. So. Uh, mm -hmm. If there are any questions about the talk related to the slides, then uh, the people can raise their hand and ask. So, um, Shrutan, are you there? Hello, yeah, sir. I'm here. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Shrutan had uh, a question. So, Shrutan, can you please ask? Yeah. yeah, am I audible? Am I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 you are. Yes, you are. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, sir. So I think you slightly touched upon the answer to the question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, so if we look at the way AI has progressed, uh, initially mm -hmm. AI was all about search and uh, knowledge representation and logic mm -hmm. and all that. That's what was people were focused mm -hmm. about, focusing mm -hmm. about. Yep. And today, if we see everybody keeps speaking about deep learning and reinforcement learning. If you if you take a field like NLP, uh, computational linguistics, and all that. It was mainly about setting up a knowledge base, and people used to program in Prolog and use first order logic, propositional logic, and all that. But today, you have deep learning and transformers, and mainly it's it's out of a paradigm shift. So while search even remains to be like the search formulation of problems remains to be uh, relevant today, also as you showed today in the game playing avenues. The other things like logic and knowledge representation, how relevant are they in today's research scenario? Yeah, very much so, right? So in fact, there's this huge upswing of uh, interest in something called neurosymbolic AI now, right? And so everybody understands that deep learning brings uh, a lot of power to the table, uh, but uh, only for certain things, right? So this whole symbolic reasoning where people use logic and you know knowledge representation and other things to solve really hard problems, right? That part is kind of getting the short shrift now. Uh, so what people are looking at is, hey, what are the ways in which we can combine the power of this neural uh, representation plus the symbolic representation that was up there earlier, right? So uh, this is nothing new to AI, right? So AI actually goes through the cycle of things, right? So people were doing symbolic in the beginning, and then came perceptrons. Everybody threw out the symbolic part and then said, oh, only this. You know the connections are important, symbols are not important, and then you know the person saw dry, the died away, and then people started going back, and then neural networks came in, and uh, then again after a while people went back to looking at uh, you know probabilistic logic mm -hmm. models and things like that, and now deep learning has come in, so people abandoned that. So, so this kind of going back and forth between symbolic and connectionist, right? So this is a dance that the AI community has been doing. Uh, for a long time, right? So, uh, like I just told you, multiple cycles, uh, and uh, so there is again a, a, an interest uh, in looking at uh, neurosymbolic AI. In fact, I've been doing quite a bit of work recently, also. My last couple of papers, I, I think you would find that uh, 
we are been looking at statistical relational representations where we combine first order logic and probabilities and rl right so uh, in, to, in coming up with uh, uh, you know hybrid hybrid approaches for solving non trivial problems it's not just me so there is this uh, conference triple ai which is the you know flagship uh, ai conference and uh, so triple ai this year's theme was neuro symbolic ai so they tried to focus more on that as well so yeah, it's coming back it's coming back that is a role for it uh, so there are multiple things why why people want to come back to the symbolic space right uh, partly uh, it is due to the ease with which humans can understand the symbolic space excuse me humans can understand the symbolic space uh, as opposed to a neural neural substrate right so it's easy for humans to communicate easy for humans to understand what the decision that the ai has made and also quite often uh, it's easy for us to put down knowledge that we have about the world in terms of this kind of uh, logical uh, representation as opposed to priors on weights or something right so uh, so that's one of the main things that is driving uh, 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 the neuro symbolic approaches and the second thing is uh, you can it's it's kind of easier for us to talk about you know consistency checks you know making looking at robustness and making sure you don't do all these kinds of silly things like uh, uh, the the adversarial goalie example that you saw right it's easy for us to write down those constraints uh, when you when you are in a symbolic space as opposed to in a in a neural space completely uh, having said that i should say that there are a lot of people who are uh, you know like religiously saying that these two Shouldn't, the trend shouldn't meet. So there is no role for neural representation. Deep learning is also a fad like multi-layer perceptrons. It will go away. Everyone will come back to the true AI, which is symbolic AI. And then there's another fat, other faction that says, hey, come on. Yeah, neural net, deep networks have solved everything, right? We don't need symbols anymore. And every symbol that you need will evolve in a neural network somehow. So, yep, yep. And yeah, there are religious wars to be fought. Uh, but yeah, sure, they're coming back. Okay, sir, thank you. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, any, uh, any, any other like hands? That? Any other hands? Okay. People do know that you can raise hands, right? Like that? Yeah. Not yeah there is. Okay. okay, yeah, Rahul. So, it seems that reinforcement learning would be well suited for robotics, but uh, at least in uh, entry level robotics competitions and as such, it's not used as much. Do you think it's because of the computational requirements or something else is at play? See, see remember I told you, right? I mean, here is that is the slide here, right? So, reinforcement learning, you shouldn't be using RL when you have good controllers available for some things, right? Uh, so, for example, Hey, if line following does the job for you, why do you want to do R? Right? So you, in fact, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in, in, in this, uh, what, what uh, Peter calls uh, layered learning, uh, uh, which kind of gives you the sense of hierarchies, but that's not what he talks about, what he really means, right? So there are many, many different, very hard problems in, in, in robotics that you have to solve, right? And some of these people have studied for decades and have very strong, very robust solutions. Don't resolve them with ROA. I mean, just pick them up. There are other more complex solutions for reinforcement learning to work on, right? So there is this, like this, at the very highest level, you have to look at, uh, uh, you know, planning, you know, reasoning and things like that. At the very lowest level, you can do PID controllers. Somewhere in the middle, we have a good role for RL. So, so I don't think RL should be the only algorithm that you're using for robotics. And I think in many of the competitions are at the stage uh, where uh, you know PID controllers plus rules at the top, right, are, are are good enough for you to do very well on the competition, right? Once you have those, see, first of all, many of this competition when you're building your own platform, right, getting the platform stable is the it's like 80% of the battle. <laughs> and then thinking about algorithms on top of it. So I think I think partly, like you said, the competition setting is just that uh, um, there's not much role. Uh, but then as you can see in competitions like Robo Soccer, people do use RL, right? So in, in variety of variety of uh, situations, but certainly not for simple things like perception and 
you know localization and all that but, uh, they try to use tend to use rl for more uh, uh, complex things yeah, i'm not sure if that answers the question but uh, yeah jay dev yeah good evening sir yeah so so my question was like uh, uh, as R, the uh, basic concept behind rl is uh, self learning so as a, uh, can we use rl in stock market analysis because it is really hard to predict prediction in stock market uh, um, sure what exactly do you want to do so like predicting like uh, because that is will be a really hard job like uh, how the market will react it's 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 a purely a time series prediction problem right so what you really have to identify is what are the what are the external factors uh, that are influencing this time series i think the challenge is that right so if your goal is going to be hey i want to use rl to make sure that i get the right set of factors on which i'm going to build the time series model okay yeah sir then yes that is the role for rl if you are saying that hey i'm going to replace my time series prediction model with the reinforcement learning engine uh, maybe maybe not i'm not sure right i mean we okay. I, I mean yeah you have to think about it but then i i, I think there is a scope for rl but but remember right where the experimentation part is involved then rl is great but okay. if it is just a simple curve fitting uh no Okay, sir. Yeah, got it. Sir, one more question. Uh, sir, I recently saw uh, on the RBCD website that uh, you you trained some Navy officers for on our ML and AI course. Oops. Like, so, uh, so, so, sir, their main job is they have field work. So, how can AI and ML help them in their work? Like, so, <laughs> how exactly? Okay, let's put it this way. So, Navy is actually, I mean, they they do a lot more than you think, right? So, there is a there is a naval training college, and there are there are the places where they are actually doing some, you know, some experiments with uh, with uh, uh, AI and so on and so forth. And uh, but then the way that we train them, the the level at which we train them right now is more on the, on an awareness level, right? It's not like they are. they don't get a degree or anything they can go back and start doing stuff right so this is more on the awareness level so that they can go back and they know how to evaluate uh, you know new technology that says that they are using ai in it right so that's the kind of level that we are we, we have been training them okay so not, so not that they can go build their like, own ai it's just okay. so it's kind of like uh, introducing them like how it what exactly yes. it is Okay, what exactly and get give give them some kind of hands on thing how to build solutions there will be a lot of use cases and other things in the program more than you know the math and coding and stuff like that. they do a little bit of coding but very fundamental like python okay. stuff yeah. thank you sir yep anybody else so what would so you so what would you consider a good approach to reading research papers oh man i have to point you to my other talk that i had with madhavan mukund <laughs> he spoke for a whole hour on a variety of things on, on like this right uh, it's it's there online somewhere it is one of those acm india events uh, but then read a lot i mean what do you what is the right approach um, it works something i mean the, so you should you should navigate it like you navigate a graph right i mean you shouldn't i mean you should start off with some random papers that you want to look at and then uh, you basically take the paper as a seed and you go out forward in direction from it basically look at papers that cite that paper and build on top of it and also go backward in direction because uh, you would also need to get a better understanding of how this paper came to be right so you you kind of uh, read the papers this paper has cited right so you kind of do this kind of graph like navigation and uh, and if you don't know exactly what you want to work on i would recommend starting off with some of the latest uh, conferences like neurips or icml or triple ai and read some of the papers there and then navigate out from there right? so, so typically the neurips triple ai papers you can only go backwards in time but that's fine so you'll know what kind of ideas that they were building on top of right so that's the 
uh, way to find the papers. How do you read the paper? I mean, it's it's tricky, right? So depends on your level of sophistication in the field, how, how long you have been reading papers in the field. So the first few papers will be hard going. So you have to read line by line, you think, or oh, let me not skip forward anything. I might miss something important. Uh, and then, uh, but then as you keep uh, getting more and more experience, you'll know, you'll know how to skip. You know, you can read the introduction and the experiments and the conclusion. We know exactly what is happening. And then you go back, okay, okay, this seems to be an interesting thing. Let me go and find the details and you go back and start looking at it. But I would not recommend that as the pathway to do it uh, initially, right? So this you do only after you get a certain amount of familiarity with the, with the literature. Okay? It takes a while, but you will get there. Yeah, Manav? Good evening, sir. Um, so thank you for your talk today. Um, so you highlighted the importance of RL in games. So my question was, when do you see us trusting RL more in the real world domains? Like, do you believe there's a need for a shift of focus towards explainable AI? Like we know deep neural networks generalize well. However, we don't really know the prime uh, reason for it. Yeah, sure. So, I can, I can, I can answer. Okay, am I allowed to say the in answer? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Explainability, trustworthiness, interpretability, robustness, all are very important. In fact, I, I, I can I forget. I mean, I've, I've been doing this multiple talks now because everything is online. Uh, so uh, there is this very nice uh, concept. Uh, there's this paper called uh, Need for Elites, you know, things like reliability, right? repeatability and explainability so you have these are elites they end with il of course safety and also elity even though it's not uh, doesn't end with ILT, right? so this is essentially when uh, when the technology reaches a certain uh, level of maturity right uh, you are no longer surprised that the algorithm works you don't no longer surprised that the technology works just showing proofs right proof of concept is not sufficient that AI has now at least come to a point where <clears throat> again we, we can go back and say hey proof of concept is not Sufficient. I want the elities. I want the explainability, the reliability, and all that. Right. So I think it's certainly there, and we have a lot of work to do before we can make sure that uh, we can trust uh, uh, the AI solution that you are working with. In fact, I never signed up for voice authentication on my credit card, even though every time they ask me to sign up. Sure. Well, thank you so much, sir. Uh, just a follow-up question: Why were you skeptical about the alpha fold results which are achieved? Like, I'm not skeptical about the results. I think the alpha fold results are all kosher, right? I'm skeptical about the fact that the protein folding is a solved problem because alpha fold can't explain to me why it does, why it folds the protein that way. So again, the explainability question in it. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So Vijay, you said you had some canned questions, right? You want to get to that now? Uh, sorry, sir. You said you had some pre-prepared questions. You want to get to that, or have they been already yes. asked? Yes, they, they, they've been asking uh, them okay. like two questions only. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'll wait for the next hand up then. Yeah, Nihal. Uh, Nihal. Yeah. Um. Hi, sir. So, in your talk, you mentioned uh, uh, omnivorous learning, right? So, okay. is this in in some way similar to embodied AI, where like an agent tries to make use of uh, sound and sight and all the senses of perception it has available to it? Yeah, see, perception is only one part of it, right? So, I mean, how do you use the perception, right? So, um, I mean, I'm mean, doing tabula rasa learning, even with the perception. Tabula rasa means blank slate, right? So, I mean, I actually starting from, uh, from starting from blank and trying to build up everything using that, right? So, that's not, that's not sufficient, right? So, for example, I'm talking about all kinds of feedback, not just the, uh, the visual perception things like that. I could look at the human behavior in the world, and then I could use that, right? Human demonstrations could be an input. The human could actually be guiding me in other ways. Human can tell me, okay, no, 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 that is not what you're supposed to do. Do something else. I mean, that's not really demonstration, right? That's just essentially an advice, right? So all those kinds of information could come in. And then I could have, you know, uh, you know, playbooks, right? I mean, some kind of, uh, you know, look at the expert book, like, like a chess opening moves or something like that, right? So I could actually look at those kind of expert, uh, things and try to learn from that as well. So that might be a little bit of supervised learning, little bit of RL, little bit of uh, you know search planning, all of these. When I say omnivorous, I mean consume all information that is available to you, including things like domain models and so on, so forth. Not just the uh, perception part. 
Okay, sir. And uh, as a follow-up, have there been any uh, papers on this, uh, or do you think there are any references which I could? Uh, um, not really. Not really that I can think of at the top of my head. Yeah. There are a few cognitive architectures that talk about this kind of uh, approach. I mean, this is a very general philosophy, right? I don't think. People have started writing papers or books or anything on it yet. Mm. Yeah, nothing, nothing. I mean, pops up to my head. If I remember anything, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you, sir. So, Manu, you still have something to ask? Oh, sorry, I forgot okay. to lower the. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I think else? Niranjan, you had some questions. Uh, Niranjan, are there? There is nobody by the name of Niranjan. Oh, there is Niranjan. Okay. Uh, yeah, go yeah. Mohit. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, yeah. My question is slightly different from what you are, what you've talked about. Uh, if you see outside India, a lot of research has been driven by, you know, industrial research labs, is, uh, and it's been increasing these days. But in India, I, as far as I understand, that culture has not been that prevalent. In uh, you know, a lot of it has been driven by academic institutes, if I understand correctly. So, looking forward, how do you think this is going to proceed? Are you going to see more? Change. Things are changing. Things are changing. So um, there are a few uh, research groups that are trying to do good work in India as well. Partly, uh, uh, so um, partly like uh, these are multinational companies that have Indian research labs that they are trying to do non-trivial research work, right? And there are also Indian companies that have that are trying to do a good research. Uh, but but the economy the scale right so we really uh, uh, India is is a big country and all that but uh, yeah, we don't really don't have uh, that much spare money to sink into this research kind of uh, I mean a lot of factors that kind of inhibit why uh, uh, large scale research doesn't happen in India but it's, it's changing slowly slowly uh, we're waking up to it and there are more and more investments coming in right and for example TCS has a very strong uh, uh, Research investment in India now, right? And uh, so, so do multiple companies that there are uh, like Amazon, Google. Uh, all these guys are beginning to improve their uh, Indian research. Person, Microsoft, for example. Uh, in fact, Microsoft Research has got such a good lab that there are people from outside India, like people doing PhD abroad, who want to come and do summer internships in Microsoft Research India, not just Indians. And so, so there are there are pockets of these places that are coming up and hopefully uh, yeah, a few years down the line there will be a lot more right thank you I, but, I mean I've, I've been i've been in the indian uh, research ecosystem at least for 15 years now and i'm i the upward trend is very clearly visible for me now i'm pretty optimistic okay that's promising yeah 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 uh, can you hear me yes yeah yeah yeah, so, uh, so my question is, so currently reinforcement learning, a lot of focus is on games and uh, many other aspects. Uh, my question is, when do you think it would become, say, profitable on a large scale? And how, how in what ways would it, do you think it can become profitable? Reinforcement See, I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there are some interesting things which RL, uh, I mean, people are using reinforcement learning for, right? So it's beyond games, right? So for example, I don't know if you looked at the Loon project, um, L O O N loan. So th that's a balloon project. We, I mean, the, which Google unfortunately shut down recently. But uh, people are actually using RL to fly the balloon, right? There's like this huge balloon that could go anywhere in the world and then give you network connectivity there or something like that. Right? I mean, so this is a very, very challenging RL problem and all. Uh, and uh, then the bunch of, uh, for example, I, I work with uh, some uh, problems where we are solving very large scale logistics. Supply chain management problems using using RL, right? 
And uh, likewise, uh, there are other uh, domains where we are actually trying to use reinforcement learning, which I can't talk about. Uh, in in uh, in in, in, in uh, actual real life applications, right? And uh, so, for example, another another one, right? So we actually have been looking at uh, uh, you know bidding in power markets and trying to regulate power, and there's so many so many uh, uh, complications that come up. Right there, and so it's very hard to actually have a close form uh, solution. There, right? So you have to do some kind of experimentation. So again, uh, we are looking at ROE. So until we come to a point where reinforcement learning algorithms are fairly standardized, right, and you don't need to have, you know, a faculty member or a top flight researcher from one of these companies. Uh, 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 plugged in to solve the RL problem, right? It's 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 for that particular setting. RL is still going to remain uh, a niche thing, right? So uh, I I think I think largely uh, it's because uh, a good fraction of the reinforcement learning development uh, has been uh, in, in in more like an online setting, right? So that's where RL, RL really comes into its own, uh, but. Uh, people are very wary in, in the industry setting to say that okay, I'll have an adaptive learning agent work online. Especially given the kind of uh, you know errors that learning systems make now, having something sit online and make those errors will open up the company to so much litigation. Right? So they are very wary of doing that. So now it's a huge effort. In fact, if you look at both academia as well as an industry, people are doing a lot of work on trying to look at what's called batch reinforcement learning or offline RL. Uh, where they still are looking at this kind of explore exploit uh, thing that is the core of reinforcement learning, but trying to do it with uh, you know pre-gathered data, right? What is the best way we can take get value out of this kind of uh, information, right? And it could be because the equipment is too too expensive to keep running while the RL uh, is learning, so you do a bunch of uh, runs, get the data, and then give it to the RL agent, or it could be like a live system where you don't want the RL agent to do experimental actions. Just gather data and give it to the RL system and see how it performs with this offline data, right? And uh, once you have very robust ways of doing this, right, I think then RL will become more and more uh, widely deployed in commercial settings. Right? So I think that would be the uh, uh, one of the things forward uh, for reinforcement learning and also easier to use toolkits, standard robust algorithms, etc. But all of this would come out of uh, 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 this kind of offline learning as well. So I think that's that's one of the things we should be looking forward to. All right. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I actually Finally. add up add, yeah. add a little bit to that. So um, I think as sir, so as as sir said, so it's a uh, like as of now, RL is a very research oriented topic. Like more like I'm not saying that it's not carried out in industry, but it's still a very research oriented topic. And so if you see robotics uh, around six, seven years ago, uh, there was still a lot of research going on. And now it has started to shift to the industry and like, mo like most of the stuff has shifted to industry. So, uh, and because RL, so in RL also we can, ex we can expect the same thing, but still there are a lot of moving parts and uh, the, the, like the enthusiasm in, I think in RL has come only because I think the, one of the breakthroughs has, has been that DeepMind's Atari and uh, then this leaf and all thing, uh, AlphaGo thing happened. So after that, yeah, people started actually realizing, oh, this can work. And uh, yeah, I think maybe like in six, seven years, we can imagine like, cause although the horizon after five years in artificial intelligence is very blur, like not even five years, like uh, you cannot expect what next will happen. But I think this will slowly start going to uh, like some real world systems uh, where we can actually see and like, okay, this is where uh, the thing is working. And then we can look at, uh more like uh, more more on like research more into like maybe explaining those systems and interpreting and stuff like that okay so finally yeah. have Niranjan putting his hand up yeah 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 Niranjan, you have a question yeah yes hello sir so so in your all lectures i found the topics on bandit algorithms particularly interesting and really intuitive and this is because of the nature of the simple problem setting and the mathematics is very comprehensive. So what is the role of Bandit algorithms in, today, in the modern day RL and are Bandit algorithms used in games as such? In game setting, not that much, right? But then there are a lot of applications of RL like where the explore exploit part comes in, right? Where people do use uh, 
uh, uh, bandwidths a lot, right? Uh, so, for example, in advertising, computational advertising, bandwidths are used a lot, right? And also in recommendation systems and personalization, and in, in so there are some uh, you know parameter optimization uh, uh, applications that you can use uh, contextual bandwidths. Right? So, yeah, so bandwidths are used in in many. In fact, bandwidths are used in some deployed computational advertising systems as well. Right, so which you can't say for RA in terms of so that is I mean that, uh, a bunch of other things that we do. For example, we have been looking at a bandit uh, thing for uh, you know managing right share platforms. We have been looking at bandit approaches for uh, uh, you know city scale budget planning. So I mean bandits are are, are pretty widely used across multiple domains. In fact, there's a whole whole body of literature where people don't even call it R and they just call it multi arm bandits. And like, what is the like, now? Now I think banner algorithms research they still focus on like finding lower bounds and asymptotic correctness and other things like that. So the papers, what is yes, the, I mean there's a whole bunch of applications that are there which don't care about. That. But yeah, papers are still written about regret bounds and. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sir. That's Anything else? Yeah, so I think uh, Rakshit, are you there? You had a question. Um yeah. Um so like um I saw the I saw on the website about the research going on in like connecting RL with attention mechanisms. So like yep. Could you maybe like touch up on that a bit? Huh. So attention mechanism. So it's tricky. Uh, so what do you see? The thing is, uh, uh, so the, the 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 cognitive science people had this whole notion of what is attention, right? And then uh, the deep learning people have this notion of what is attention, which is essentially like. A, Multiplicative factor on your inputs on, uh, at some level, so that you are uh, like a gating function, right? You are filtering it. Only part of the output goes to the next, next, uh, uh, next level, and so on, and so forth. Right? So this is kind of a, a, a less, uh, like a more computational form of attention and less uh, cognitive side. Right? So I have been very interested in the cognitive side of attention, where uh, you know you look at a world. I mean, it's just kind of like the filter, but uh, but a filter applied at the perception side of things. You look at the world, and then there are very few things that you would like to attend to when you are trying to solve a problem. Right. So so suppose you are uh, you know trying to open a bottle. Right. So you don't you don't really customize your policy based on the color of the bottle or anything. You only look at the cap. Right, and then what what the cap does, and then uh, and then based on that you would have a policy for it. Right, so that is basically one one notion of attention. And there's a lot of work that we have done uh, in uh, looking at RL and that. And the other notion is the 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 uh, the the deep learning notion of attention. Right, and again there uh, nowadays what is very popular is this notion of a soft attention. So having like this uh, as this vector uh, attention weight. Right? But then uh, people at the early days were even trying to look at what is called hard attention. Now people don't do hard attention that much anymore. The so hard attention is when you actually have one zero uh, attention vectors, and it turns out that that's you know hard to uh, optimize for directly. When as soon as you go into this kind of integer integral space, and there it made more sense to look at uh, uh, RL, right, and try to use the reinforced trick. Uh, in order to define this distribution over this one zero vectors and then learn out those distributions. So people actually looked at attention in that way, right? So and uh, so we have done. We did try some experiments with that. We tried to push push that direction, but uh, we didn't have too much promising results. So we have actually fallen back on using you know, the regular attention in the network, uh, but looking at uh, attention outside. The network looking at uh, focusing your uh, computation on certain areas and so on. So, in fact, you should read the uh, the recent uh, hierarchical planning paper that we have in ICAPS. I think the, the final version should be out in a couple of uh, days, uh, where we talk about a planner deciding on what the uh, reinforcement learner should act on implicitly, 
but it's actually really cool. I like the fact that the planner not only sets a sub goal for the RL agent, uh, but it also decides what features the RL agent should pay attention to. So it's, there's no deep learning there. Fortunately. It's still layered, but not deep layered in terms of hierarchies. Yeah, thank you. So like adding up to that question, so so uh, like as of now in deep so deep reinforcement learning, there are not there is not much uh, research done on sort of building some inductive biases uh, in the function approximators. So like uh, in in uh, like in image domain, uh, convolutional neural networks have been very successful. So that's partially because of that inductive bias, which was built into the way convolutions is carried out. So maybe thinking about like thinking specific to RL. So nowadays, like mostly when we do deep RL, we do not. Uh, we do not care much about the kind of architecture we are using neural network, mostly like MLP or stuff like that. Or if you want some recurrent thing, we can use recurrent policies. But uh, maybe like thinking in that direction, what could be some inductive biases that a reinforcement learning agent could exploit? Uh, that that might be like a good direction to uh, go on. This is an that's an excellent question, right? So what we have been mostly thinking of, right? If you remember that that one picture I had on the DQN slide, right? So one way I've been thinking of is that, hey, the bulk of the RL part, right? Uh, the, the, the deep network part is on the feature learning, right? So any inductive bias that is useful for processing the input features that I have, right? It would be useful in this case. So for example, if I'm working with text and RL and LSTM or a recurrent network, and then followed by a, a, a couple of fully connected layers for doing the queue learning should be good. Or if you're dealing with images, uh, you know, whatever you want, right? So whether you start with convolutional nets or you want to go all the way to some BGG inception, whatever, mm -hmm. and all of those, plus a few layers of fully connected architecture on top of it for doing the control learning should be good enough, right? So that's been kind of largely how people have been looking at uh, the decision for the active bias for learning, right? But turn around and ask, okay, is that an inductive bias for learning? policies, right? That's an interesting question. So what would be, is that, is that a bias that's good for learn, like a mm -hmm. policy basis bias, right? In fact, there have been work in RL where people talk about base keys, right? That are good for learning value functions, representing value functions and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, now it will be interesting to see if some of those biases uh, uh, that people have talked about. For example, uh, it could be proto value functions, or could be eigen value bases, or could be Bellman basis functions. There are a variety of a few few of these uh, basis functions that people have talked about for representing. Is that a, is that a computationally tractable way of doing them? Right. With the, with the deep architecture, that would actually be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is a question, yeah. Hmm. So uh, I think Aditi, you had a question. Yeah, uh, good evening, sir. My yep. question is uh, not exactly related to RL, but more like in general sense. I came across uh, this research project in the RBCD website on AI and ethics for the Indian context. Yep. Given that there has been a lot of buzz on ethics and AI, I mm -hmm. think yeah, in Google in the US, especially right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So mm -hmm. India has like hey, that is not the right kind of buzz, but anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like I mean in general. So uh, given that India has like way too many diverse cultures, languages, and all, yep. how exactly is this like project? Like, if you could give a little insight on how they're gonna go about it. So for example, I can tell you some of the specific sub-projects we're looking at, but I also would recommend uh, picking up this recent paper by this lady, Nitya Sambasivan. Okay. So Nitya Nith works at Google, uh, but she wrote about, I mean, her team wrote this paper on why uh, uh, AI ethics should be looked at in a different lens for India. So I think it's actually a very nice read. Uh, so one of the projects we are looking at, for example, is, hey, um, you know, uh, India is moving to a very, very, very quickly is moving to a digital economy. Right, and uh, this surprisingly is actually making it harder for migrant workers uh, to get into banking. Which is, I mean, this is something. I mean, don't ask me why, but 
this is something which people are being observing on the field, right? So now the question is, is that something that AI can do to mitigate that? Is there some way you can actually make it more customizable? Looking at that, that is one thing that we are looking at uh, from from the migrant population point of view. So uh, that is one one special project that we have. We have put out some kind of uh, you know like a broad view idea document identifying certain technologies that need to be developed for doing this. Uh, let's see where that goes. Another project that we have been looking at is uh, on uh, on healthcare. Right? Uh, this is complete, purely driven by the social science people. So, uh, uh, so looking at the perception of healthcare in 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 in, uh, in AI in healthcare in India, right? So, looking at okay, what is it that uh, people are? I mean, do people perceive this as fair, unfair? I mean, look, access to all this AI technology that is coming in, and and uh, and those kinds of questions, right? So, again. Um, that's something that got completely stalled because of COVID. Right? So that is one part of it. So the third project that is running is just more relevant to the question that you asked, right? So people talk about uh, you know biases, you know bias-free RL and I'm sorry, bias-free ML and so on and so forth. How would you? What is the interpretation in India, right? So talking about something that is statistically you know bias-free in terms of certain protected attributes and so on and so forth, it's it's fairly easy to express computationally. Whether to solve or not is a different question. It's fairly easy to express computationally. But you come to India, there are so much more constraints. It's no longer uh, a simple question of being statistically neutral to certain variables. right? If I say gender, then I should have the same fraction of decisions, positive decisions and negative decisions made regardless of the gender. right? So. Uh, that, I mean, it's no longer that simple, right? So in India, there are so many, so many constraints. You have additional things. Legally, you are mandated to be unfair statistically in certain situations, right? Uh, is that a is that an easy way to express that? Is that a computationally tractable way to express that and optimize for that, right? In, and can you put out, uh, say, some kind of a toolkit that says that okay, you plug in your uh, uh, you know your uh, allocation strategy, your your reservation for strategy policy into this engine here, and out it will spit something that is fair with respect to that strategy. Right. So that is one thing that we are looking at. So there are um, uh, things like I mean, this is uh, this is not something which is very common in uh, places outside India, right? So I don't think people will uh, spend too much time looking at. Those kinds of uh, work, so we have to solve the problem for ourselves. Right? So that's part of it. And then a few other things that we have done. I mean, for example, the notion of whole notion of privacy. Uh, Indians don't have a notion of privacy. We are very happy to peek our uh, poke our head into our neighbor's window and actually walk over and offer unsolicited advice. And that's 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 all kosher for us, right? So. All this uh, super obsession with uh, privacy is kind of a Western, uh, Western social construct. Right? So, so what what is what is the notion of what is the appropriate notion of privacy for the Indian context? So that itself, for example, is not clear to me. And, uh, and so there are a lot of very interesting questions to ask like that uh, uh, for for. Uh, 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 for the Indian context, right? So, we are, it's it's pretty nascent. Uh, uh, I'm I'm happy that we are doing it because um, not many people are actually doing it in the Indian context. I mean, Google is one who has started. Microsoft is a uh, few ethnographers are looking at it from Indian context. And uh, IIT Bombay has a center that looks at uh, technology ethics and in India, but that's about it. Right, so we need more people to look at it, and there are a few. I like it because there are a few law schools now that are starting programs on AI and ethics. They should have. They should have had one on technology and ethics, which they don't. Probably they didn't get funding to start any of those, but now at least they are starting one on AI and ethics, which uh, this is interesting. So I think uh, we'll we'll make progress there. Uh, but more more and more people need to get into this. But I uh, yeah. But I told you a sample of three programs that we are running right. Now. I don't know if it completely answers your question but that's about the best i can do yes sir, it does answer my question yeah anyone else uh, sir i had a question yep uh, am i audible yeah you are you are 
with a little bit of echo but yeah i can i can make make come what is it uh so uh, with remote research becoming so popular because uh, of covid uh, not how is it popular but yeah inevitable like, uh, yeah. yeah so how uh <laughs> how do you, how do you suggest how do you think is a good way to progress research when so many uh, papers are computationally infeasible for students don't compete with the googles and the facebooks don't try to solve the same problem they are solving so it's just it's not going to go anywhere uh i mean i mean forget about being remote right even if you are in iits or iisc or any of these top research places in india or even in the us right i would say competing with these guys is actually um um yeah not not a not a fruitful uh, uh pursuit because the the compute that they have can like beat you down like anything right so yes sir don't, don't, don't compete with the non compute right so what you should be looking at is looking at interesting problems that that uh, you know that people haven't really looked at I mean conceptually a different problem for example all some of these ethics questions right so you don't have to or the explainability part right because it's it's not like uh, the, these things have been answered for simple solutions so it's even for simple architecture so there are a lot that you can do in that right and uh, then uh, of course uh, vidya can talk to about some of the multi agent stuff he is doing which uh, not too many people are actually looking at and doesn't need a lot of computation right now because even for simple games people haven't solved it. like even simple multi agent setting people haven't solved it so there are problems like this right so where uh, even for computationally simple situations they are uh, uh, you know, theoretically hard and so people have been Uh, not making much progress on it uh, and so you could pick up those kinds of problems and solve those and those would be the uh, uh, right right direction to go and don't 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 run the same race the googles and facebooks are running uh, yes sir thanks sir. Yeah. yep so we are done right yeah uh, yeah and uh, yeah there are no more questions like so like whatever the questions i had the people had sent so they are over so yeah i think mostly yeah, it's yeah, done yeah it's yeah it's 5:40 so yeah yeah actually like uh, we took a lot of your time <laughs> so sorry for that but uh, it was a great session uh, it was great to have you the a great talk and a great interaction session So thank you. Uh, thank you very much sir and uh, I I I had fun also I mean, the questions were interesting some yeah so I had fun talking yeah 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 and uh, look thanks yeah okay um yeah thank you sir and uh, have a great weekend you too thanks